Thank you, Brother Keith, for feeding us in that time of worship. The path to victory is always a path of sacrifice. We see that in our daily lives, we see that in history, we see it in sports, the teams that are victorious, and the teams who are most disciplined, willing to endure pain and sacrifice to achieve the goal, or if you're the Patriots, they cheat, you know, whichever <laughs> way it is. You see it in history, you see it in war, the path to victory is always a path of sacrifice, those who... Win are usually those who are willing to sacrifice their all to win. Even with the end of World War II, you see the dropping of the atomic bomb to bring about the end of that great war. The path to victory is always a path of sacrifice, which means that victory can never be found by a lazy person. This is true for Christians as much as it is true for Jesus Christ. I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 12. These past few weeks we've been preparing ourselves for Resurrection Sunday by looking at these passages through the Gospel of John, seeing the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who He is and what He came to accomplish. And this Sunday we're going to see in this passage that the path to victory is the path of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you want victory, you must choose the path that Jesus walked and has called you to walk. There is no victory for those who choose not to follow Jesus Christ. Before we jump into the text, I invite you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the amazing love that you displayed on the cross. We thank you, Father, that you loved us even when we were sinners condemned to die, even when we were your enemies, that you loved us and sent your Son to die in our place. We praise you for your faithfulness and thank you for your amazing love, and we ask that you continue to show that love to us this morning as we turn our humble hearts to hear from your word. Lord God, if our hearts are not humble, I pray in this time you will humble us before you. If our ears are not open to hear from you, Lord, I pray that you will open them to hear from you. Lord God, if we in our sins are not ready to repent and turn to you, I pray that you will work in our hearts in this moment to make us ready to meet in this place with the living God. That we might not leave here unchanged. We pray that you, Lord God, the consuming fire, will change us, will remove the dross, will purify us, and that in this time you will make us more like Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. This is Palm Sunday. We remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. We're not going to look at the triumphal entry. We're going to look at what happened immediately after the triumphal entry. In this part of John, in chapter 11, we see the resurrection of Lazarus, a dear friend of Jesus who was dead for four days before Christ called him out of the tomb alive demonstrating his power over the grave. And all of these people have heard about this resurrection of Lazarus, this culmination, if you will, of the signs of Jesus that have amazed the masses. And they have all been gathering around to see Jesus and to see this Lazarus who is dead and is now alive. And Jesus, as the Passover nears and this massive Jewish festival is about to take place, he comes to Jerusalem being hailed as the Messiah, but he does not come as a conquering warrior on a mighty steed. He comes on a donkey, an animal of peace in which he comes as the Prince of Peace. He comes not 
with arrogance and pride, but humble, ready to save his people. He comes with a purpose, a purpose that the people do not conceive at this point. And as Jesus enters into Jerusalem and all the crowds are flocking to him to, to see him and to praise him and to shout Hosanna, to herald him as the Messiah of Israel, we see the response of the people, particularly the Pharisees, starting in verse 19. If you'll read along with me in John chapter 12, verse 19, it says, So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. So as Jesus is coming in, all these people are flocking to him because they've heard of the signs, or some of them have seen the signs, they've heard of the raising of Lazarus, and they want to see Jesus. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, are looking at this, and they're saying, we have tried to silence him, but we have failed. Look, the entire world is going after Jesus. They're going away from us to follow this Jesus. We have to do something about it, and we're going to see, if you read through the rest of the Gospel of John, what they choose to do about it, as we'll read next week. But to demonstrate how the whole world is going after Jesus, John records for us these Greeks who are coming to see Jesus, these Gentiles who are God-fearers. They want to worship the God of Israel. They're there in Jerusalem to worship the God of Israel, and they hear about this Jesus, and they want to see Jesus. So they go to Philip, one of Jesus' Galilean disciples. I don't know if they think they have a better in with Philip than maybe with somebody else and so they come to Philip they say we want to see Jesus that's their whole purpose as all the crowds are coming to see Jesus so also those Greeks want to see him to behold this powerful man Philip and Andrew they come and they tell Jesus that these Greeks want to come and see him and Jesus as he normally does in the gospel of John does not respond quite as we would expect him to respond in verse 23 it says Jesus answered them saying the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. So put yourself in Philip and Andrew's shoes. They come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, there's these Greeks who want to see you. And he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Okay, Jesus, but do you want to see the Greeks or not? You know, what do you... Jesus responds to this following that's coming after him, leaving the Pharisees, leaving the religious leaders of the day, coming to see Jesus, heralding him as the Messiah. And these Greeks, these Gentiles, are also coming to see Jesus. And Jesus looks at all of these people who are coming, who are being drawn to him, and he knows full well who they really are. Jesus knows full well that while they're coming to see him, they are not coming to believe in him. We won't read it this morning, but in verses 37 through 43 of this chapter, you can read about the rejection of Jesus, that they were unwilling to be open about their belief in Jesus because they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Jesus knows the hearts of all of these people who are coming. He knows that within a, less than a week, these people who are crying, Hosanna, blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord, will also be crying, crucify him. But this is what Jesus came for. And so he responds by saying, the hour has come. The hour that I've been looking towards. The hour that I've been living towards. This hour has finally come for the Son of Man to be glorified. But it's not in the way that you think. It's not that I'm going to be glorified by the masses coming to me and praising me because of the things that they've seen. He says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies... It remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. In my shed, I have a bag of grass seed. 
that I bought probably two years ago. The bag is unopened. The seed remains in the bag, healthy, fine, all alone. My yard looked horrible. <laughs> it has no grass because I've never put the seed there for the seed to die in order to bring forth a beautiful yard. It's an understandable concept. Jesus says if the seed remains by itself, that's all it's going to have. But if the seed dies, if you put it into the ground and the seed no longer is a seed, it loses its life, it does so to produce something amazing. It does so to produce an abundance of fruit. And Jesus says, this is what I must do. Jesus could remain alone. Jesus, as King of kings and Lord of lords, could remain alone, enthroned on high, leaving the world to die in our sins. But Jesus came to do something far greater. Jesus came to produce something far greater than this world has ever known. He came to die so that in dying he could produce the church, his people, a people saved from all the peoples. Jesus came to produce fruit, and he knows that in order for that to happen, he must die. And he says, those who love their life literally destroy it. There's an action here that the translation doesn't quite capture when he says those who, lose it, who loves his life loses it. It's not just loses, it's that he actively destroys the very life that he loves because he's not willing to lose his life. But he says those who hate their life in this world, and that's key to understand what he means, those who despise their life in this world, who see that this worldly existence is not really all that important, and are willing to lose this worldly existence, he says those people they will guard or they will keep their life for eternal life. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you are so obsessed with this worldly existence and you love it so much, you are going to destroy yourself in the long run. But if you recognize the futility of life in this world and you recognize the vanity of the pursuits of this world, if you recognize that this life is not your best life now. Jesus says you preserve your life for eternity because you're willing to let go of this temporal, vain existence, willing to sacrifice if necessary that you might obtain something eternal. He says this is what I am willing to do. I want you to skip with me to verse 27. We'll circle back to 26 in a moment. Jesus says, Now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. But the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered and Others are saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. There's only three places that we're told that Jesus is troubled. When he stands before Lazarus' tomb and sees everyone weeping, he's troubled. And we have that beautiful verse, Jesus wept. Here it says that his soul is troubled. And later in chapter 13 when he talks about Judas' coming betrayal, it says that his spirit is troubled. Basically as Jesus is beginning to face the reality of what's going to happen to him, his soul begins to be stirred and troubled as he looks at death, the death that awaits him. 
It is an unpleasant path that Jesus has set before. He says, what should I do in the state of a stirred or troubled soul? Should I say, Father, deliver me from this hour? Would that not be our response? Is that not our response when we are confronted with a life that is miserable or when we are confronted with a path that is painful? It's not our response to say, Father, deliver me from this hour. But Jesus says, no, that's not going to be my prayer. Because it's for this hour that I came. My whole purpose is for this moment. This painful path that stirs even the soul of the Son of God and troubles Him. It's for this purpose I have come. And so instead, He prays, Father, glorify Your name. This hour that will bring glory to the Son of Man is also an hour that will bring glory to the Father. And in this moment, God the Father speaks from heaven as he did at his baptism and as he did at his transfiguration on the mountain. And he says, I have glorified it, meaning the life that Jesus has lived, the signs, the miracles, the the wonders that he has done. The Father says, I have glorified it in you and I will glorify it. There's a past action and a future action. The past he has already accomplished through his work on this earth, but the future lies ahead of him in the form of a cross. And so this voice, this father, uh, the father from heaven speaks and says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to answer your prayer. I'm going to glorify myself in what you're about to do. And the people, they, as we normally do, don't get it. And they think, well, maybe it's thundering. I don't know if there are clouds in the sky or what makes them think it was thundering. An angel spoken to him, and Jesus says, you don't get it. This voice didn't come from me. He doesn't need reassurance from the Father that the Father is going to glorify him. He knows full well what the Father is going to do as Jesus and the Father are one in unity. And so he says, this voice didn't come from me. This came for your sake so that you could know that this hour is not just the hour of my death. This hour is the hour of my victory. This hour is the hour of judgment. Judgment is coming upon the world, and the ruler of this world is being judged. And he says, in this moment, as you see me hanging on the cross in a state of weakness and humility, I want you to understand it is actually my victory you are beholding. Because as I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. And so Jesus is saying, all of you people have come to see me. But it's not till I win my victory that I will actually draw you to believe in me. Jesus knows that these people, that their faith is shallow, that it is weak, that it is false. And so he simply says, I want you to understand the way that I'm going to die so that when you see it, you understand that's what you're coming to. A crucified Messiah. But when you see that moment of weakness, and people have considered this for 2,000 years, that Jesus was weak in that moment. When you see that weakness, you see that humility. You see that shame of a man hanging on a cross. I want you to understand it is not shame. It is not weakness. It's victory. Jesus Christ won the victory through his death on the cross. There is victory in no other work, in no other deed, in no other event than Christ crucified. And we can look throughout this world for options available to us for victory. Victory over our sins, victory over our problems, over our struggles. These things that offer us solutions. But Jesus says, you don't understand I have to die in order to produce life. But whenever I do die, I will produce life. I will grant victory. But it is only through my death that it happens. So if you're trusting in anything, anything other than the crucified Jesus, if you're trusting in anything other than Jesus on the cross for victory now and forevermore, you will be disappointed. You will lose. Because there is victory found in no one else than Jesus. And Jesus obtained victory in no other way than the cross. 
God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. We saw the love of God last week in chapter 3 as Jesus came to save a people from all peoples. When he says, I'll draw all men to myself, he doesn't mean that all people will be saved, but it simply means that from all of humanity, I will draw a people unto myself from every tribe and nation and tongue and language. I will draw them to myself. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus is simply saying to the crowd, this event that's about to happen that you're going to call for, my crucifixion, when you see it, when it happens, you're seeing the victory that is made available to those who believe. And when we believe, though we are born sinners, we find victory over our sins in Jesus Christ. Because on the cross, Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is what Jesus did on the cross. So listen to me. pain or the struggle that you are experiencing or will experience. The solution for you is not found out there. The victory over sin and death and the power to walk victorious through this life is found only in the crucified Jesus Christ. Now over these past several weeks, we've seen many things we can find in Jesus. It would be life, faith, family, love, freedom, victory. But it's important for us to understand and what Jesus is trying to say here to these people is that you only find those things in Jesus when you're willing to find your path in Jesus. When you're willing to find your way of life in Jesus. When you're willing to, as he says, pick up your cross and follow him. Go back to verse 26 with me. He says, talked about those who love their lives will destroy it. Those who hate their lives in this world will keep it to eternal life. And he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Remember the context. All these people are coming to see Jesus. Not to follow him, but to see him. To behold this miraculous man. But he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. It is... So important for us to remember that Jesus wants us to be where he has been and where he is. He's going to say later in this gospel that the servant is not greater than the master. Jesus is saying in this whole passage, if you want to serve me, you've got to follow me. And then he says, this is where I'm going. I'm going to the cross. So catch what Jesus is saying. If you're going to serve me, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to experience the victory I'm going to give you, you have to follow me. And if you look at my path, my path leads to a Roman cross, a place of shame and pain and humiliation. And that's exactly where you're going to have to go as well. The Christian life, the call to follow Jesus is not a call to a nice life. It is not a call to an easy life. Because the path to victory is always a path of sacrifice. We must be willing to follow Jesus in his sacrifice, denying ourselves, dying to self, as Jesus did himself. But he says, those who do this, those who serve me, the fa Father will honor him. Just as Jesus was honored and glorified in the resurrection, vindicated by the Father and shown to be who he said he was, so also those who follow that path of Jesus, who are willing to die to themselves, willing to pick up their cross and follow him, they will receive honor in the end. Yes, the path to victory is a path of sacrifice, but it does lead to victory. It does lead to celebration. It does lead to honor. If we're willing to follow Jesus' footsteps. Go back down to verse 34. 
as Jesus has talked about being lifted up, they understand what he means, that he's going to be crucified. They say, the crowd then answered him, we've heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? If you look in Daniel chapter 7, you can understand their confusion. In Daniel chapter 7, we're told that one like a son of man approaches the ancient of days and he receives an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting dominion. So not just like a nation that's going to last after he's dead, but that he himself will rule forever this nation. And so when Jesus says the son of man must be lifted up, the people are confused saying, I thought the the law said that the son of man would last forever. You're saying that He's going to die. Are you the son of man? How is this working, Jesus? They don't understand. And again, Jesus doesn't give them a straightforward answer. He simply says to them, For a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light. So that you may become sons of light. Again, Jesus doesn't say, well, yes, I'm the son of man, and you've got to understand resurrection, and you've got to understand. He doesn't do any of that. He simply says, now's not the time for doubting. Now's not the time to question. Because you only have me for a little while. I think Jesus would agree with the crowds that the Son of Man lives forever. I think Jesus demonstrates through his resurrection that the crowds are right, that the dominion given to the Son of Man is an everlasting dominion. He doesn't correct them because they need no correction there. They're correct in what they say, but they don't understand that he must die before he can obtain that everlasting dominion. And so he simply says, look, Basically, yes, my reign will last forever, but your option to follow me doesn't last forever. Yes, Christ's dominion, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom, but our ability to repent and believe in Jesus Christ is not an eternal ability. We have a moment that the light shines into our lives, that we can respond to the light with faith, And that we can follow the light with obedience. We have a moment that we can find our way out of the darkness into a path that leads to victory. We have a moment. And then we die. The moment ends. And the darkness consumes. And Jesus says, enough with the doubting. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons and daughters of the light. When I was in Jerusalem many years ago, I got brave enough to go off by myself. It's a dumb idea. But I started to walk around the old city, and I got completely turned around and lost. Uh, those of you who have been, you know, that's, it's really kind of confusing maze that they've built within the old city of Jerusalem. So it's real easy to get lost. And unlike Poland, where we are going, not a whole lot of people speak English there, at least not well enough to communicate with what I needed. And so I had nobody to ask. I had no phone. I had no ability. I didn't even know. I couldn't even remember the place I was staying, what the name of it was. And here I am in... Jerusalem, completely and totally lost. And uh, the man who was leading our trip, he told us, if you ever get lost, don't go outside the walls. If you go outside the walls, you go into the city, you're just lost for good. You will see you in the afterlife kind of deal. He <laughs> said, if you get lost, find the wall and then walk along the wall. Eventually, you'll arrive at the Sheep Gate. Just remember, you are at the Sheep Gate. Our hotel is right inside the Sheep Gate. Just walk till you get to the Sheep Gate. You may be on the completely other side. You may be two feet from the Sheep Gate and walk the whole way around. But as long as you stay with the wall, as long as you stay on that path, you'll get there. 
Well, it's not a nice, easy cut path around the wall of Jerusalem to get to the Sheep Gate. There's all these crowds that were pushing, and there's all this temptation I have. Well, maybe if I go this way, I can cut past all these people. But I remembered, just stay there at the wall, no matter how hard it gets. Just stay there, and you'll find your way. And I did. And thus, I'm here and not <laughs> on the streets of Jerusalem roaming around with a long beard. Jesus calls us to follow him. Not to understand every step, but to follow him. He calls us to walk in his path, not to enjoy every moment of the path, but to walk in it. Because you're not going to understand every moment of your journey. And you're certainly not going to enjoy every moment of your path. When your path is the path of Jesus Christ, though it may lead through death itself, it will come out in victory in life. You may come to a moment of doubt. Where is this path taking me? Why does it hurt like this? But in that moment of doubt, remember the troubled soul of Jesus and how he was willing to continue because he knew what lay on the other side. And if you and I are willing to continue in the path that we find in Jesus Christ, then we will sing victory in Jesus forevermore. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I am awed by your strength, your character, your faithfulness, and your willingness to go to a cross to bear sins that you did not commit, to bear the sins of the people who despised you, You despise the shame of the cross, the glory set before you. And yet we shrink back the moment our path gets a little rough. God, forgive us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will strengthen us. That where you are, we might be even if it's a place of pain, of uncertainty, sacrifice, or even death, for there is no greater place to be than with you. So Lord, strengthen us as you lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. That no matter how dark it may be, that we would follow the light all the way, not giving up, not turning back, not sitting down, not surrendering, but that we would follow you all the way to glory. We thank you for the victory that you have won and for your grace in offering that victory to us. Help us, Lord, to live in the victory by following you in faith. In your name I pray, amen. I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know if this is a time of pain for you and struggle or if this is a time of joy and peace. I don't know if this is a time of doubt and uncertainty or if this is a time of everything's going great. But I do know that each and every single person in this room is called to follow Jesus no matter what your life is like. Knowing that the path will be rough, but it's the only path that leads to life. For some of you, maybe you haven't started walking that path. 
Maybe you've claimed Jesus your Lord and Savior, but you have not begun to follow him as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, then let today be the beginning of your journey. And yes, the journey will be tough. But the end will be worth it. And if that's you, I'll be down here to pray with you, to talk with you. But brother, sister, sometimes it's just as believers, our journey gets a little tough and we doubt and we fear or we shrink back. And I want to encourage you to follow Jesus who did not doubt. And while he may have been troubled, did not shrink back. He pushed forward unto death because of his faith in the Father. Should we expect to be called to anything less? Push forward, Christian, through the doubts, through the uncertainty, through the fear, through the pain. Walk the path of sacrifice because that is the path of victory. Please stand with me and let's sing our song of invitation.